This episode of the Backpack and Light podcast is about wildfires. We're going to talk about their causes, effects, impacts on backpackers, and what backpackers can do in response to having longer and more intense wildfire seasons. Stay tuned. Look for me in the mountains where walking has a way of pulling you to your peace of mind. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Backpack and Light podcast. I'm Ryan Jordan, and I'm flying solo today because our producer and co-host, Andrew Marshall, is out on vacation. For today's episode, we interview Jaden Bales, the Communications Director of the Wyoming Wildlife Federation, about wildfires, which is the theme of today's podcast. First, a couple of uh, things just to catch up on what I've been working on and doing lately. I'm getting ready to go into the Bighorn Mountains in north central Wyoming for about nine days. Chase and I are heading up there with some friends and are in search of large backcountry trout via Tinkara fly fishing. And we are heading off trail into a fairly remote section of the Cloud Peaks wilderness. The Bighorns are... Uh, a relatively um, uh, low visitation wilderness area when it comes right down to it. Now, they're crowded on the trails because there is a peak in the middle of the Bighorns that is a very popular peak to climb, and that is Cloud Peak. That's what the Cloud Peaks Wilderness is named after. Cloud Peak is a 13,000-foot peak. It's one of the tallest in Wyoming, but it is the largest of Wyoming's big mountains. And so it tends to be a pretty popular destination and it attracts a lot of attention nationwide. So we're heading into that area, but our focus is not going to be on climbing and scrambling, but on uh, just enjoying the alpine scenery out there, hopefully getting out of some wildfire smoke that is invading the rest of the West. And that's how this trip came about. We had to cancel our primary trip and I'll talk about that after our interview with Jaden and, and talk a little bit more about how this trip came to be. In terms of gear, the featured piece of gear I want to talk about on today's podcast, the category is inline water filters. So the idea behind an inline water filter is that this is a filtration device that weighs anywhere from two to four ounces generally, maybe a little bit heavier. And it screws into a bottle. Now, it can be a bottle that is sold uh, with the filter device, and it might have some type of proprietary connector to it. An example of this would be the Be Free, which is compatible with uh, hydro, hydro flask bottles. The other two popular types of filters are the Sawyer Mini Squeeze and a new one on the market, which is what I want to talk about today. And that is the Platypus Quick Draw. And so for those of you who are unlimited members and are watching the video version of this podcast, I'll hold this up to the camera. And the, the interesting thing about the Platypus Quick Draw that I really, really like is that it's, it's high quality. It is not uh, the cheap kind of plasticky feel that most uh, inline filters have, and most plastic goods for that matter um, have. The, the plastic is um, housed in, a, in kind of a rubbery housing that allows you to grip the filter uh, much easier and, and just provides a good high quality feel, but it doesn't do this at the expense of a lot of weight gain. So you're still looking at a filter that's only 2.7 ounces or so. And so the idea here is it, it ships with a bottle. It's a platypus, sort of a dirty water container, and it's a one liter bottle. And the, the quick draw screws into the threads of that bottle like that. And then it's got a port for drinking uh, right there and a, a cap that protects that drinking port and keeps it clean. The thing I really like about the quick draw is that it not only works with the bottle that ships with it, obviously, but you can attach it to the mouth of the little bit narrower mouth uh, standard platypus bottles, and it's cross-compatible with those bottles. Now, inc incidentally, 
it can be uh, also screwed onto the mouth of a smart water bottle and a whole bunch of other aftermarket bottles that you might find on a through hike when you resupply at gas stations and grocery stores. So the Platypus Quick Draw, um, in addition to the quality, the thing I really like about this is uh, it's fast and it's pretty reliable. And I think I've been able to get more flow rate out of this filter with dirtier water than I ever have been able to get out of the Sawyer Squeeze. And it's marginally better than the Be Free, which has been my favorite for several years. So I think this, I, I still, the book is out. I'm going to wait to make a judgment on it until I've, I've finished with the summer and I've got several trips under my belt with this. But right now I'm going to go out on a limb and say, this is probably the highest quality of the inline filters that is available on the market. And again, I'm going to wait to make a claim on reliability, but in my experience so far, it's the most reliable and has required the least amount of back flushing when compared to the Be Free or the Sawyer Squeeze. Okay, so there's my featured gear for the day. Let's go ahead and get into the topic of wildfires. So our interview is with Jaden Bales. Jaden grew up in a family where their family business was focused on firefighting support. And I want to talk a little bit about wildfires in general before we dive into the interview. So um, let's put a picture up on the screen of one of the biggest fires that is um, burning in the United States currently. This is the bootleg fire in Oregon. And this has been a tremendous, uh, tremendously powerful fire. 400,000 plus acres have been burned. We've lost structures. Um, the devastation caused by this fire is almost incomprehensible. And, and the way this blew up, it's, it's, it's achieving some containment now. This is August 1st when I'm recording this podcast. And I believe its containment is uh, well over 50%, but we're not out of the woods yet because it is still surrounded by a ton of fuels. But the firefighters working on this fire, several thousand people have built some really incredible fire containment strategies and fire lines to um, keep this fire from getting bigger than it already is. So let's, let's use the backdrop of the bootleg fire to talk about an introduction to wildfires in general. One manifestation of climate change is the increase in the prevalence and intensity of wildfires. And the reason for this is because high temperatures, the combination of high temperatures and low humidity levels desiccate fuels. That means they, it dries out the fuel. So if you have really dry air and that's exacerbated by windy conditions and hot temperatures, the moisture that's normally present in fuels readily escapes those fuels and they dry out. What we're seeing now is the season in which those fuels achieve very dry levels to the point where they are easily ignited by some um, event like a lightning strike or perhaps some accident, human accident. This season is getting longer and longer. Now, we're also seeing increases in ground surface temperatures and the amount of heat that the ground surface absorbs throughout the day and night because warming nighttime temperatures are uh, creating drying conditions. It doesn't give the forest any relief at night anymore. So you've got this increase in ground surface heat and you have atmospheric pressure differentials that are increasing. So this creates conditions conducive to the natural ignition of wildfires from lightning because you've got these massive atmospheric pressure differentials that now create uh, these storms that um, have a massive amount of lightning impact. Then you've got residential and commercial development and then the normal uh, activities of humans in small civilizations and communities. So this includes transportation and utility infrastructure. We know that 
at least one major fire, including, I believe, the campfire from a couple of years ago, was sparked by a faulty power line or transformer or something like that. I don't recall the details. So you've got transportation and utility infrastructure. You've got the use of machinery outdoors, things like chainsaws and uh, people pulling uh, camper trailers and RVs where their chains are dragging on the ground and, and throw sparks off that could ignite roadside vegetation. And then, of course, you've got outdoor recreation where wildfires have been sparked by people who've been careless with either fireworks or smoking or campfires. Uh, but uh, these fires have been started by people who have been recreating outdoors. So all this is going on in increasing uh, frequency near wildland boundaries. And so this all has increased the risk of what we call anthropogenic or human caused wildfire ignition. Now, as wildfires grow larger, the risk of pyrocumulonimbus cloud formation increases. So up on the screen now, I will put a slide up of a pyrocumulonimbus cloud. This one was formed by the bootleg fire and extends into the atmosphere almost 30,000 feet. Okay, so these pyrocumulonimbus clouds are really important because what happens is there's so much heat being generated by these mega fires that, and then you've got this smoke plume that's forming from the mega fires. That heat rises up that plume high into the atmosphere, and then it hits the cooler portion of the atmosphere and starts to condense into these massive cloud formations called pyrocumulonimbus clouds. These clouds can cause lightning. They can cause what are called fire tornadoes, so actual tornado weather events. So what's happening is these fires are creating their own weather that is then creating winds and tornadoes and lightning that is feeding the fire further. So uh, we are seeing more and more pyrocumulonimbus events as a result of mega fires than we have seen in recent years. And these are causing um, significant concern with the firefighting community because once these, these cloud formations form, the fires become incredibly difficult to fight. The other thing that these mega fires cause is long range air pollution. And this air pollution can negatively impact humans that are several hundred or even several thousand miles away from the wildfire. In the case of a wildfire large enough to cause a pyrocumulonimbus cloud, you can get the transport of air pollution uh, spanning several thousand miles across the globe. This happened in Australia. We saw this with fires in California back in 2018, and we're seeing it uh, last year with some of the fires in Colorado and this year with the bootleg um, and the Dixie fires as well. So the air pollution that we're seeing all across the West is something that we're going to talk about um, for backpackers to uh, consider as they go out. I know my air quality here in Laramie this morning, I walked out the door and it was in the 130s, 140s AQI. That's pretty high. And this is the kind of air quality that leads to an orange tint in the sunlight. Um, definitely can feel it in your throat and lungs and breathing and it impacts your exercise and it certainly impacts those who are sensitive to um, some of these respiratory illnesses. Okay, so let's move on to our interview with Jason today. Jason, as I mentioned before, grew up in a family where their family business was focused on firefighting support. He's a backpacker, a backpack hunter, and a backcountry skier. Currently, Jaden's the communications director for the Wyoming Wildlife Federation in Lander, Wyoming. But his homeland is in eastern Oregon, which is currently see, seeing one of the worst fire seasons on record. So with that as an introduction, let's get right into Andrew's conversation with Jaden Bales. All 
right, Jaden Bells, thank you for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me on. I'm excited to talk about uh, Wildfires the West and a little backpacking with you. So yeah. I really appreciate the opportunity. Well, uh, tell us who you work for and give us a little bit of background information on, on sort of how you grew up. Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, I wanted to address the fact that you know there are thousands, literally thousands of, of firefighters out there on the ground right now who are working in the trenches to try to keep these uh, wildfires contained and to, you know, keep people safe and and to protect uh, structures and people's livelihoods and stuff. And I just wanted to acknowledge the fact that uh, I'm not one of those humans and uh, they really deserve a whole bunch of credit for all of the time and energy and, and for putting themselves in danger. I mean, just five firefighters up in Montana got burned over last week uh, that were injured. You know, and this is this stuff that we're talking about can, can really, uh, it, 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 it hits people hard, right. When it comes to local communities and, and a lot of people are putting themselves in danger. So I just wanted to acknowledge them first, um, before I dive into this, cause I am not one of those folks. Um, but I hope I can communicate some of the things that we can do better as the public to, to help them out. Um, so I grew up in Northeast Oregon, um, outside of kind of halfway between Boise and Portland on the dry side of the mountain. Uh, our family growing up, we had a contract wildland firefighting business um, in, in addition to the farm that we that we ran. And uh, so my role was always to help kind of provide support on, on those contract firefighting, uh, you know, projects. So, you know, whether it means driving guys a bunch of supplies or fixing machines or in trucks that were broke down from fighting fires, um, I was kind of tangentially related to the, the wildfire world uh, from that. Uh, but then now my job is the communications director here at the Wyoming Wildlife Federation. Um, I'm stationed in Lander, Wyoming, which is a great location here in the center of Wyoming. Um, and one of the things that we work on is public land management. Uh, we help get folks, uh, you know, encourage people to go outside and recreate responsibly. Uh, we're a, a hunting and angling organization primarily, but we work in all sorts of uh, public land management and advocacy um, so I figure maybe I can provide a, a pretty good uh, overview of information for you guys. Um, and, you know, on the side, personally, I'm an, I'm an avid backpacker and backcountry hunter. So um, I've got a little bit of personal experiences to go with this, this whole wildfire conversation that I, I hope it's valuable for you guys. And I really appreciate you. Let me hop on and talk a little bit of this stuff. Yeah. So let's just do a little bit of background information on – on fires just to get started and then we'll move towards the back half of the conversation into what we can do as uh, backcountry adventurers to mitigate our own personal risk. But um, So let's start with, let's just just go super basic, go back to the basics and say, okay, what what are the two um, categories of major causes for wildfires? Oh man, so just to break it down, you usually have your Human caused and non-human caused, your natural causes. Um, for the most part, your you know your natural causes are primarily um, your natural causes are primarily lightning strikes, and and especially in the big wilderness areas. And by wilderness, I'm I'm more talking about little W, not big W wilderness. Um, mm-hmm. That's where you're going to have the most um, fire fire starting. You know, high up on these peaks where it hits a tree, or really what'll happen is it strikes a, a big tree or, or, or uh, uh, some dead wood up on the top of a mountain, and then it smolders for a bunch of days. So you'll see these natural fires. Actually, they crop up usually a few days after a big lightning event has come through. Um, largely, that just means, you know, like a big lightning strike, and, and then you get this ground smoldering, and then all of a sudden you get some, some wind picking up, and then that turns into an actual fire. Um, so you'll notice that a lot of these come not directly after a uh, – or not during a lightning strike, but just right after a day or two. Uh, and then we obviously have all the human caused fires. Um, and that spans a, uh, just a, a wide variety of things that we can do, uh, incorrectly. You know, a, a lot of times I think folks kind of focus on, uh, you know, campfires that get out of control or they don't get put mm-hmm. out properly. Uh, but really, man, we're, we're seeing a lot of different, um, accidents really i mean i don't think very many folks have intentionally caused these things uh but a lot of them are just you know misusing um let's say your 
misusing equipment, right? Like I, I know there's some mm-hmm. fires that have gotten started by chainsaws. Uh, some fires mm-hmm. get started because when people are on the roadways, they let their chains drag when they're pulling a trailer and they'll spark, you know, as they hit the, as they hit the roadway. And, um, I've actually even seen, uh, they got the fire put out. It didn't turn into anything big, but I saw a video of a friend of mine. He shot his bow and his bow ricocheted off of a rock and sparked and started a little grass fire out in the prairie. Wow. So there's a whole bunch of ways that, uh, that, you know, humans are causing fires. And, um, like I said, I don't think, you know, for the most part, most folks, uh, it's not really intentional, but you know, those unintentional consequences when things are parched and dry or, they have really big uh, repercussions if you're not careful. So, yeah, those are some of those are some of the big things. Yeah, like fireworks, or even even you know these these people having um, <laughs> gender reveal parties. That was a big one that started a huge fire last year, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I was just reading about that, and that in you know that fire unto- unfortunately took a couple lives, and and those folks um, are being held responsible. Um, because of because they yeah. started the fire, so you know, and that's something else. There was a there was a giant fire in um, outside of Hood River a couple of years ago, kind of near Multnomah Falls. If folks have driven through on I eighty four going to Portland, um, and uh, and that big fire was started by a kid with fireworks, you know, and he just yeah. was out there lighting stuff up, and then holy cow, the whole canyon's on fire. Um, yeah, no, it's it's this stuff is it it gets out of hand quick. So if you look at, at InsaWeb and you look at a map of the United States, um, obviously the bulk of the fires burning right now are in the west. There's a line up the up the Sierra. It's, it's really interesting. You can sort of see the shape of the mountain range um, just by the by the the fire incidents. And I was wondering if you could speak to what are the conditions that make um, the west ripe for wildfires whether naturally caused or man-made or whatever you know the I, i've heard and i don't have the exact stat for you guys but i have heard multiple times that the united states western united states is one of the most arid places with such a large land mass in the world so it's mm. not the largest desert necessarily but it is arid just overall right and so this year the vast majority of the west this arid naturally arid climate uh it has has we're all in, when i say we're all in a drought there's a large portion of the west that's in a drought this year um i i always look at the droughtmonitor.unl.edu and you can kind of see like pretty much right where you see all these fires man it's in severe to extreme to exceptional drought um across the west and you can kind of correlate a lot of these fires with with just exceptionally dry conditions on a year-to-year basis um and you'll see i think it was last year and the year before you know alaska had a bunch of wildfires that i don't know that we talked a whole lot about in the lower 48 Mm. but it was because they were in a a severe uh, drought cycle and now they're not you know so we're not necessarily talking about them so i think a large part you know you'll see especially from as a result of climate change you'll see these drought conditions um coming and going a little bit more frequently uh or coming and staying longer um and that is a that is a major factor when it comes to um when it comes to these wildfires the other thing is uh you know the the way that you know through changing weather patterns and, and climate conditions we're having a lot more uh fuels of readily available fuels on the landscape um so you know as as back in you know probably pre-colonial times is what you'd say uh pre-colonial uh, uh, you know you had wildfires taking out a couple thousand acres at a time and leaving a mm-hmm. nice regime of some fire here and then some old growth mm-hmm. here and it just you know patchworking now now we've gotten through a uh, a long history of, of fire suppression and as well as um kind of hands off management on on some areas of the wild, of the forests and you know that like leads to a lot more um fuels in the fuels on the ground to torch up um in addition to invasive species uh mm-hmm. you know cheatgrass especially in that that Nevada Wyoming, or you know southern Wyoming uh, all the way to Oregon and up into Washington, cheatgrass regimes, man, have have really caused uh, quick burning fires to just kind of move across, especially that sagebrush country. And then uh, the cheatgrass comes back up; it's highly flammable and will burn again before any of the native uh, plants get a chance to reestablish. So, um, 
a lot of changes here have caused these fires, and, and that's, I think, where you see uh, such a strong representation of, of wildfires in the West is just from all these changing conditions. Right. You've also got what, like, um, uh, pine beetle kill off stands of trees that, that are just dead and, and just waiting to, to go up. Um, and then and does, 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 uh, an increase in ambient temperature play any role in this at all? Yeah, absolutely. So both of those, both of those two things are other really important factors, mm-hmm. you know, especially when you look at, um, kind of the Rocky mountain West, that pine beetle kill has been a bigger factor. Um, just last year we had the Mullen fire and the Cameron peak fire, uh, in Northern Colorado and Southern Wyoming. Um, and both of those were, you know, some of the biggest fires of all time. I think it was the third largest fire since the, uh, the Jackson fire in Wyoming. And, uh, and that was, that was 1988 was the giant Jackson fire. And then uh, in, in Colorado is, uh, you know, some of the biggest fires ever recorded were last year. Uh, mm-hmm. In large part, like you said, that's due to that, that's due to that uh, pine beetle kill that, that when those pine beetles come in there, um, they kind of, you know, just kill that tree and then eventually it falls over dead. And then all of a sudden you get this matchstick like mm-hmm. uh, appearance on the ground of these forests, man. And if anyone's hiked around in that country, it is so hard to walk around. It's, it's pretty understandable. You've just got tinder boxes laying there. Um, and then, like you said, once that ambient temperature gets above average or, or like last year in 2020, we had a crazy drought in Wyoming. Um, and it's not quite as bad this year, especially in that southeast corner where that Mullen fire was. They had good precipitation this year. But last year coming into it, there were really dry fuels and, and aided by some higher temperatures. Man, it was it was a uh, big fire waiting to happen. So, and you know, we got it. <laughs> that's that's yeah. the unfortunate part is, you know, they, they come through when all of these uh, – it's kind of almost in, inevitable it feels like when we have these perfect scenarios. There's uh, – yeah, you, you get the whole – mixture of of things that cause these large fires yeah so we have big big changes being driven by what seem to be you know small temperature changes with climate change but actually on on an earth scale on a geological scale these are these are huge changes um but um we're also dealing with an ecosystem that is somewhat adapted to and dependent on fires and and our management of these ecosystems has historically been problematic can you talk a little bit about um maybe how traditionally western culture has has managed um fires so um man back in and and i'm i don't want to totally butcher this date it was i believe 1910 um there was uh, a series of wildfires um, that burned millions of acres between Montana, uh, Idaho, and Oregon. And it was, you know, the Frank Church, basically, if you're familiar with the Frank Church wilderness, the whole dang Frank Church nearly burnt. Uh, you know, I, I just uh, looked at this while we're talking about it. Three million acres burned in 1910. Since then, we've taken a really proactive um, kind of approach to suppressing fires, for one. And secondly, you know, we had quite a bit of logging, you know, following that 1910 period, especially, you know, as, as we saw a lot of industrial development across the West. Um, so that logging at, coupled with fire suppression meant, you know, we had quite a few years there where there wasn't, you know, as, as catastrophic of fires as it didn't seem like. Um, then, you know, as we talk about, you, you know, cutting back on our logging, that has, uh, you know, eliminated a lot of um, – where well, I guess that is that is added to the fuel sources in a lot of ways. In addition, like our fire suppression has, um, in various areas, allowed or kept things from burning when maybe it would have been nice to have a, a two thousand acre fire there rather than a four hundred thousand acre fire there. Um, some interesting things now, though, and, and as uh, you're looking at forest management, uh, we're taking this information that we've learned um, from the past and are trying to apply it now. And the bootleg fire up in uh, you know, outside of Klamath Falls in Southern Oregon, had some uh, tree thinning that, that was done in um, in efforts to manage for wildfires. So I don't think they necessarily wanted to test this tree thinning 
theory as aggressively as they just did with a 400,000 acre fire. But um, they had a really good, they, you know, they're showing some good evidence from the fire that thinning forests uh, has created an, a he- more healthy um, fire regime. And, and, and what that looks like is just making sure there aren't, you know, just super, we call it dog hair, thick timber stands, uh, you know, with, with dried out, uh, you know, really thick lumber stands that are going to burn hot and, and, and reduce the amount of, uh, the, the reduce the amount of recovery that we see there. So in these areas in, in the bootleg fire, it was kind of wetter country that had big, big timber and then, uh, some brush, you know, low brush. So really what happened was that low brush burned and it actually it was very good for that low brush to to burn a little bit and uh, have regrowth this next year. Uh, and then it didn't catch all of the giant timbers on fire because they were largely uh, spaced out enough that um, that didn't get so hot that they were going to go completely torch. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see, you know, like I said, that fire is still raging. Um, it'll be interesting to see after the dust settles what happened with that, you know, management and how we can continue to implement that um in our in our forest management plans and 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 on private ground too so it's it's uh we're at an interesting kind of inflection i think um and we probably have been for the last 10 15 20 years of of trying to identify how we can find a good balance of managing our forests and and also managing um (laughs) kind of people right um at at the same time on the landscape right yeah, I live in the Tahoe Basin, which is an extraordinarily wealthy area, and um, I think that there has been some historically some kickback against controlled burns and forest thinning in this area um, because it, you know, if you're a millionaire or a billionaire and, and uh, you've got smoke from a controlled burn drifting over your your boat, um, you're going to say something about it and. Uh, and so I think that's one of the things is that we're struggling with um, private property uh, butting up against public lands, these these large areas of public lands, and, and how to manage that, um, like you said, and deal with the people. Yeah, totally. And and it's unfortunate, but um, the, the the places that people want to live, um, myself included, are, are right mm-hmm. up against these kind of most fire-prone areas, right? I mean, everyone wants that nice – little secluded pocket in the timber up above town. And, and, um, again, that, that's also where you get the most conflicts too. If, you know, if, like I said, someone accidentally, um, running a chainsaw and catching a spark on, on a rock or something and, uh, starting a fire. Yeah, we got it. A lot of this is, I think more of a, of a human management issue as, as well as the, the forest management. Yeah. And, um, do you, <laughs> In your role as a as a communicator and an educator of people, uh, what do you see as the way forward in terms of educating a population as as conditions continue to worsen? Man, the important thing is um, is, is really just raising awareness about uh, some of the fire restrictions that we have going on, um, and 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 I say that as more of like our short term. Uh, a short-term communication goal is raising the awareness around the, the fire restrictions and ways people can be smarter in the woods. Um, let's see, two weekends ago, uh, we were backpacked into the high country, um, and we, we were all about 11,000 feet, and there were some snow patches, and it was very wet. There was a, a pile of mosquitoes, I'll, I'll tell you. Um, and we caught some fish, right? And we looked at these fish, and we we're like, gosh, these would be really good eating because these, these, these high country trout just taste great. But, um, you know, there's a fire restriction, so you shouldn't have um, any fires in a unmarked, uh, an unmarked campground, basically. So, you know, knowing that those restrictions were in place, we kind of were like, yeah, we should, we should make sure to not contribute more to this issue that we have going on. And I think that's where, um, you know, a lot of folks can say you're back in there 12, 13 miles or whatever, and you go like, oh, no one will know like if we have this little fire. But really, it's, it's important to to do a lot of self-policing when it comes to that and to be really cognizant that your impact, you know, it might not be you this time or whatever, but you know, the way that you uh, interact with the landscapes um, also influences how you and your friends interact with the landscapes. And um, Mm. and I think, you know, like I said, raising awareness to being um, cognizant of your impact when it comes to camping and backpacking and stuff like that. That's a really great first step. Um, And we just, you know, we, we publish articles for Wyoming wildlife federation to try to, 
encourage people to be a little bit smarter about that um, and just be aware of the different levels that there are. So let's talk a, a little bit about that. What what are the different levels of fire restriction? Now, I, I, I wanted to make sure and pull these up um, because everyone should know these. Or when I say everyone should know these, everyone should reference these uh, and not just take my word for it. It's kind of like um, – it's kind of like telling you about some law or, you know, a, a regulation mm-hmm. that don't – you should read the letter for yourself too. So I just wanted to add that disclaimer. Um, but, you know, really um, each area that you go and visit is going to have a little bit different fire restriction for, from the get-go, whether – not not dependent on um, – just not dependent on on the conditions that year too. So you got to look that up. Um, for instance, like Wyoming uh, has these wildlife habitat management areas, and they manage for fire restrictions differently than than on forest and on BLM, et cetera. So just do do some good research here before you um, dive right into to lighten up a big old campfire. Um, stage one fire restrictions are kind of what I was just referencing when I was up in the in the Wind Rivers. Um, you know, it's largely like no, no fires, uh, except in, uh, maintained, um, campfire rings. Um, and it, it, it prohibits, you know, different, different grill types and flammable materials like outside of developed recreation sites. Um, there also are, you know, like I said, operating chainsaw restrictions and stuff in this stage one that you want to make sure you have. Uh, a, a shovel of at least 35 inches readily available for use if you're using your, your chainsaw and you have to have an approved spark arrestor on it. I don't want to go too deep down these like details because it's really, it's <laughs> right. going to be also, uh, uh, it's activity specific, um, but they're important to know. Um, and then when you're at your stage two fire restrictions, man, if it's not, <laughs> if, if you're not running a jet boil or like some other you know, MSR reactors type stove, you should probably expect it not to be uh, allowed. Uh, with that that type or stage two restriction, um, and and largely you know that just means no no real open flame when you've hit that really next level. I'm sure that that's where you're at there in uh, in the yeah. Sierras right now, uh, up the up the coast yeah. to the Cascades and stuff like that. I think it's I mean it's, it's certainly just been year round permanent. I think since I've been here is no alcohol stoves, no uh, no Nesbit you know, um, cubes, nothing, no. Um, wood fire type stoves, um, nothing like that. I was just going to point out too, like, and in, in, in some cases, you know, uh, forests are actually being shut down. And that's, I guess you, it's not on the, my cheat sheet here, but that'd be your like stage three. Uh, the Umatilla National Forest in Southeast, uh, Southeast Washington, Northeast Oregon um, is shut down right now because of the fire danger. Um, and so if someone wanted to go bu- picking huckleberries or go hiking through the, the Wenaha wilderness up there, um, and you didn't look at that fire restriction, you'd be in big trouble. Um, mm-hmm. You know, so just yeah. being aware of those things. Yeah, they can shut full forest down, and, and you got to pay attention to those things. So let's let's talk a little bit about this year and last year. And let's start with last year. Can you give us kind of a brief rundown of what the fire season last year looked like, and then kind of where things stand right now, halfway through twenty twenty one? Okay, so the last year's fire season was well. Most folks know it was it was pretty historic, especially in uh, Northern California and Southern Oregon. Um, but one of the interesting things is it was largely historic for the amount of uh, property damage it caused. Um, you know, in Oregon, there were multiple fires in that Medford Grants Pass uh, Ashland kind of area that 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 ruined a bunch of homes. And same in California, there was a, a, a ton of fires down there that ruined homes. Um, so last year was was catastrophic from that perspective. And again, like we talked about um, in in the Mullen Fire and the Cameron Peak Fire, uh, there were a couple other fires in in Colorado last year that were the biggest fires that Colorado had ever it had ever had. Um, so that was largely fueled by the the extreme drought that we had coming into that that summer and early fall. Um, this year, it's it's looking like you know maybe the the Rocky Mountain West. Um, doesn't quite have the same amount of uh, drought that was there in the same place last year. But you look at Mm -hmm. uh, north, uh, you know, in in Montana, 
uh, over to Idaho. Idaho has the most fires of any state right now. I think I read it was 23 this morning. Oregon has over a half million acres that's on fire right now, over seven fires. I mean, obviously, that's largely led by the bootleg fire. Uh, and then down in your country, man, the Dixie Fire is over 200,000 acres. Uh, you got the Tamarack Fire, which has, um, you know, caused a bunch of evacuations that they're kind of they're lifting some of those. I was just reading. Uh, there's some monsoons that have really kept the uh, the fires uh, suppressed down in Arizona. I mean, um, they got a, a good amount of moisture this last few weeks from monsoons. So Arizona w- had started off the year on just a bad note um but they're they're looking pretty good same with um you know new mexico and stuff compared to where they had started the year um now i I think the important thing to keep in mind is it's still july as the time we're recording this um last year the mullen fire didn't fire up until september um and there's a couple other fires in wyoming that have historically and and colorado that historically get started right about that september time frame um so i will say it's it I, i as far as acreage cons- is concerned, it's shaping up to probably be as, as bad, if not worse, as last year. If if we don't get a little bit more moisture coming through here before the end of the end of the summer and early fall. So that being said, um, if you are backpacking or traveling in the backcountry in the West this year, um, this summer, you need to know how to handle it if a wildfire comes up in your area. So let's let's talk about that a little bit. The website we keep talking about, I think it's important. Maybe we should we should plug that URL and uh, hopefully folks know about this website. But it's called insaweb dot n w c dot g o v. So i n c i w e b dot n w c g dot g o v. It's a mouthful, but um, InsaWeb is like – I know that you reference it all the time too. It's it's like my go-to piece of information here. Um, if someone's if someone's backpacking the PCT this year, I would imagine that their plans are totally wonky. <laughs> it looks pretty rough to try to be coming up through California right now. Yeah, um, so let's say you're backpacking and you do um, – let's say, let's say that uh, you've done your research. And you've looked at InsaWeb and you've decided that there's not currently a fire where you are headed to backpack. Um, and then you're out there for a few days and suddenly you look up and you see, you know, you see some smoke. Um, what, what's the first step in your process? Um, so the first step is normally to, to get yourself to a, a safe place. Um, so, you know, if you see smoke and it, there's there's some difference here when we're talking about this, right? Like, if um, back home, I was actually just in Northeast Oregon a couple weeks ago, and you could see this giant fire uh, plume of smoke from a wildfire um, that was 40 miles away, right? If that wildfire is 40 miles away, and you can and you can see the smoke rising on the horizon, like one thing I will tell you, it's probably been reported, and secondly, it's probably a long ways off and you know, like I said, if it's over the horizon line, you probably should just, you know, try to find more information about it um, and get to a place where you can do that, which means service or Wi-Fi or whatever. Make sure that you're not putting yourself in, in a situation that could be could go south. Um, the other version of this, though, is if you see a little plume of smoke, like you say you're backpacking on the uh, on the crest of the Cascades and uh, you see a plume of smoke that's only – a couple miles away. You know, it looks like it's just a few ridges over. Um, Like I said, get yourself to a good, safe position first and foremost. If that means packing out, um, that means packing out, right? Like don't try to, don't try to, uh, I'm trying to remember what that's called. Do not institute the sunk cost fallacy of you backpacked in all this way and like you just, you know, you can tough it out. Wildfires can move so fast. They're nothing you want to play with. Um. So I want to get the number to call to report uh, uh, wildfires here. Yeah, and we can we can put it in um, the show notes too if you just want to send it to me later. Yeah, yeah, let's do that. So you know, and, and the other the other safe bet is always to just call nine one one as you're coming out, especially if it's if it's looking like it's ripping and you're way back in the backcountry. Um, let someone know via nine one one as like, like that's always a good first step, right? There are specific, and you'll see them alongside of the road too, uh, for region specific uh, wildfire reporting lines. So pay attention to those before you go into the backcountry. Um, you know, a few years ago, I was I was going on a backpack mule deer hunt in the Cascades, and um, 
And this area that I'd been backpacked into, um, we'd scouted it. We knew we wanted to go back in there, you know, six miles. Um, unfortunately, we found out after the fa- we were made these plans that there was a fire burning about eight miles away. And so it was in kind of a buffer zone that it was just not really safe to be in there. Um, so we had to, you know, you had to make a different game plan. And, and I think that um, making sure that you're willing and, and know that those are um, – contingency plans are necessary, especially this time of year, late July into August and September. Um, it's important. Uh, it's really important to have those contingency plans uh, in the face of wildfires. And obviously the, the best thing to do would be to avoid being in that situation in the first place, which is where something like a satellite messenger or um, really good planning and research come into play, right? Absolutely, man. Um, you know, and I, I haven't uh, looked into uh, whether or not my inReach gets you a good – uh, if you can get a fire report on your inReach, but um, if you have something like a, an inReach or inReach mini, you can have people texting you updates. Uh, I would I would really think that that's a great plan, uh, and it's something that I I, I do. You know, uh, kind of that that res- that example I just gave you when we were going backcountry deer hunting. Um, you know, we were paying attention to where that fire was at all times, just in case for some reason the the, the, the winds went 160 or 180 degrees the other direction and things went really south. So it's important to stay in contact with folks and people who are uh, really paying attention as well. Um, the other thing is that I, I, I really appreciate doing is actually just talking to someone um, who is with the Forest Service um, who can give you some, some on the ground, like really good information. Um, you know, if they're like, we've got a, a series of, of lightning or of monsoonal kind of thunderstorms that have cut, rolled through or expected to roll through this next week. And, th- and this thing's a tinderbox, you know, maybe make a different plan before you go in. Like you said, that, that prevention of putting yourself in those positions, uh, is the best remedy to, to preventing any poor situations with these wildfires. Um, is there any kind of, um, mask that would be helpful in, mitigating the effects of smoke somewhat. And I could see uh, a couple of different scenarios where you'd want to be thinking about this. Um, Last year, I had some trips planned that weren't in any sort of immediate danger from the fires themselves, but they were definitely impacted air quality-wise by the smoke from the fires. And um, eventually decided not to put my lungs through that. But uh, I'm wondering if, if there's anything that you can just throw in the bottom of your pack that if you were out there and suddenly you found yourself having to walk through smoke for three days just to get out of that situation, if there's anything that you could use to be, that would be helpful. Man, a simple N95 is probably the, the best, like, quick, light, uh, you know, resource that you can have in your pack. Um, they don't cost a lot of weight, which is nice. Um, but then the, those N95s mm-hmm. actually will prevent some of those particulates from getting in your lungs. And, and, and wreaking havoc more than, um, you know, just having the mask on your face <laughs> is uncomfortable. is much better than having, mm-hmm. you know, le- legitimate lung problems. Um, when I was living in Bend, Oregon, we had multiple times where the air quality, this is uh, 2017, um, the air quality was so bad that it was like, eh, you should just probably stay inside. It was at, at the level where, um, you know, people who, even those who weren't in high-risk categories were ser- experiencing lung issues. Um, if you see uh, that air quality is getting to that level in any place near where you're backpacking, you should probably just abort those plants. Um, you know, especially, and I even yeah. think, you know, when, when you look at high exertion activities like, like backpacking, um, if it's getting bad enough that they have a warning for those uh, who are in sensitive groups, um, you'll usually see it as like an orange level of air quality. Um, yeah, you, you know, it's really probably best – uh, to, to, to reschedule <laughs> just as a, as a good, as a good standard. Yeah, that's so crucial. You mentioned the sunk cost fallacy a few minutes ago. And I, and I think that's, um, that's so important to keep in the back of your head all this time because it, it can be so difficult because maybe, maybe this is a bucket list trip. You know, maybe you, you were in a permit lottery and this is going to be your only chance for a few years to do this. And you go, oh, it's just smoke. Ah, uh, you know, what, what are the chances it could actually uh, spark up? You know, while I'm out there, and um, something I don't know, something about fires, it makes it easy to to fool yourself that it's not going to happen to you. And uh, I think it's just super crucial just to to not go into it with that mindset. 
Absolutely. You know, and, and it's that same it's that same thing that people talk about in an avalanche course. I do quite a bit of backpack skiing or backcountry skiing. And um, it's that exact same notion of like you guys can't you can't be so dedicated to the mission that you put yourself in harm's way. Um, so yeah, no, I totally agree with you there. It's like, just, just be reason, you know, when I say be reasonable, it's easy to talk about it on a podcast, right? When we haven't put the time, right. money and effort and per- yeah. drawing a permit. Um, but I think it's important before you draw a permit or before you put all this time and effort in that you address, uh, you address these things. Um, man, I'd rather just <laughs> go, go down, you know, make a left turn as, as you're headed to, uh, hood river and and uh and go to the coast instead you know do something that's a little bit uh less risky still make it still make the best of the situation you know and i know like we were talking about it's really hard to to turn the truck around but uh at the end of the day it's not worth anyone's life and uh, let alone worth anyone um you know causing a fire too it's it's just really important to to pay attention to what really matters in these situations well, Jaden, we'll, we'll wrap it up here. Is there anything um, crucial that you wanted to say that you haven't got a chance to say yet? Or, or if someone had to – if you had to sum up a takeaway for our listeners at the end of this conversation, what would it be? You know, I think right now just being aware of the increasing, you know, the increasing risks of wildfires and the increasing amount of wildfires and what you can do to prevent them is, is important. Um, that's step one, make sure that, you know, you're paying attention to these fire restrictions and you're doing your best as, as a recreator to not contribute to the issue. Uh, secondly, um, our national forests in particular and our, and our Bureau of land management lands, um, they're managed, uh, with public input. So if, if you have a, a place that you really want to go check out, um, that is, that is, you know, managed in national forests and, their planning process is coming up. Uh, get involved in that and, and, and try to, you know, put yourself in tune with what's actually happening on the landscape. Um, a good example is this: the Bridger Teton National Forest. It's all the national forest around Jackson. We're talking, you know, all the stuff around uh, a Grand Teton National Park, south to the Wyoming Range, and that all is coming up. For, for conversation here soon as part of the work we're doing at the Wyoming Wildlife Federation. And I encourage folks to try to tune in to what's happening in their national forests as well. Um, that's that next level, really. You know, once you've, once you've said, I, I'm doing my best to prevent these wildfires and to do my best as a, as a recreator, um, that's that next step that you can take to, to get involved. And so getting involved um, – with a planning process for national, for public lands, does that look like, um, public comment periods on websites? Is that actual meetings you can show up to? What does that look like? Yeah, it's both of those things. And largely, you know, as, as we're talking to a a listener base that's probably spread out pretty good. Um, if you care about the Bridger Teton National Forest, it's probably going to behoove you to, you know, leave comments and like add your experiences or whatever to that process. If you live in Jackson and and you care about this national forest, then go to those public meetings um, and be involved in the process on a, on a person-to-person level. The other thing that's important, I think, um, is while, while it's important to add your comment, it's also really important to listen to solutions that folks have presented and support or not support those solutions um, as they pertain to this, you know. Um, it, like I said, there's there's a lot of people who do work on this stuff uh, as a living, and, and then they will provide an idea or provide a solution. And showing your support or asking them to not move forward with that solution is a really powerful way that you can be involved, and it doesn't take a lot of time. All right, Jaden. Well, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. Have a great day. I hope you enjoyed that interview between Andrew and Jaden, and as a follow-up to that, I want to focus on the four tools that I think the backpacker needs to add to their quiver in response to what we now know as a brand new normal, that the summer hiking season is now entirely a wildfire season. And those four tools are trip planning, flexibility, finding more remote locations to hike, decision-making in the presence of wildfire smoke, and wildfire escape contingency. So let's start off with trip planning flexibility. During the 30 years prior to 2010, I've had to alter my summer backpacking 
trip plans only three times due to wildfires. In the 11 years since 2010, I've had to adjust my plans more than two dozen times due to wildfires, including five pivots already this summer, 2021, as a result of fires burning in California, Montana, and Colorado. In fact, a week before writing this, a new fire popped up in the Bighorn Mountains of Wyoming. My planned trip there is supposed to start next week. When that fire started, I thought, oh no, here we go again. We've made travel plans. We've made, uh, some people in our group have made flight arrangements. We've made hotel arrangements in Cody. I mean, it's, it's, it's locked in now. And so to have a fire start was pretty disheartening. Fortunately, that fire is burning fairly slowly. Uh, it's just kind of smoldering right now. It's on the order of several hundred acres, so it's not huge. And it's uh, several miles north of where we plan to hike. So my expectation is that the jet stream is going to blow that smoke to the northeast of us, and we're not going to have to deal with anything. But it's I know it's there, and <laughs> I know anything can happen, especially when north winds from Canada come down they can blow wildfires to the south. So um, I'm not expecting any drama, but I have to admit when that fire started, I thought, oh no, here we go again. So my new normal when it comes to planning summer trips in the fire prone mountains of Western North America includes the following. First, I hold very loosely my primary trip plans anymore during the summer. Second, I always plan a contingency or two or three knowing that there is some probability that my primary trip is going to get kiboshed due to a wildfire. And then number three, I hold very loosely onto my secondary trip plans. And so that's kind of how we have to roll now during the summers if you live out West. And uh, by out West, I mean primarily BC of Canada. It's having a terrible wildfire season this year. Um, an entire village has completely evaporated as a result of, I believe it's called the Lytton Fire back in June. Just devastating. Uh, Washington, Oregon, California, obviously. Idaho, Montana, Wyoming. Uh, or, uh, Utah gets its fair share of wildfires, um, but it's it's remained relatively unscathed this year fortunately wyoming has been in good shape this year which has been which has been great we experienced a devastating wildfire last uh, fall it didn't actually start till november the mullen fire a um, couple hundred thousand acres and that combined with the cameron peak fire in colorado and the east troublesome fire in colorado uh, all three of which were late summer, fall, big, big fires. Uh, we just had a devastating season last season, but we're early. Like I said, it's August 1st and normally this would be the beginning of wildfire season, but wildfire season out here has been already going on for a couple of months. And these fires last fall lasted well into late October until the first snows came. So we got a long ways to go in what is shaping up to potentially be the worst wildfire season based on acres burned that the West has seen. Colorado, of course, um, suffers greatly, not only because of drought conditions in the Northwest corner of the state, but the beetle killed pine that is all across the Western slope of the Rockies through the, through Colorado. And that's really the, that's been the source of the three big fires that we had here last year. So yeah, hold on to your trip plans uh, with a loose grip and be uh, flexible in, and competent in rapid trip planning. I've really been able to practice that lately and it's been a good skill to have in my back pocket. Now back in May, I opened uh, internet browser tabs for two websites. One that was mentioned by Andrew and Jaden in the interview, which was InsaWeb. And the other one is the fire and smoke maps that I, I, I get from the EPA's website, AirNow, and from NOAA weather maps. And I'll talk a bit, little bit about those as well. I opened those in May. They have stayed on permanently in my browser window. And um, that's, that's become an unusual habit. So kind of like uh, my, they're, they're part of my morning routine now. It's like get up, brush my teeth, 
drink a cup of coffee, feed the dog, check my county's COVID-19 dashboard and see what's happening on InsaWeb and what the smoke map is doing and the AQI is in Laramie. That's my new summer normal. And I expect that's going to be um, the way things roll for the next couple of years. Talk a little bit about um, InsaWeb. So again, for those of you who are on the uh, video version, the unlimited members version of this podcast, we'll see the map of InsaWeb up on the screen. InsaWeb is the incident information system of the National Wildfire Coordinating Group. What this does is track the daily real-time behavior of all of the wildfires in the United States. And you go to the website and you're uh, presented with this map and you can see that we have uh, quite a lot of fires burning in the United States right now. About, uh, I think there's at least 100 active fires. And this has been an incredibly valuable and addictive resource. We'll put the, a link to the website in the show notes. Um, it gives you an appreciation for how complicated it is to allocate limited resources, budget, and time to hundreds of thousands, if not millions of acres that burn across the West each season. So you can see, as Andrew mentioned in the interview, you can see the wildfires throughout the Pacific Crest, Washington, Oregon, and California this season. Incredible what is going on in the Pacific. And the I can imagine that people who have made trip plans in California or Oregon specifically. And now over the last week or so, the North Cascades are being impacted severely in Washington state. Um, they, the need for flexibility is, is pretty extreme this year. My initial trip plan was to California. That has been kiboshed as a result of unhealthy smoke conditions and fires burning in the Reno Tahoe area. And we then switched over to um, Colorado in the Zirkel wilderness. And so if we zoom in and look at Colorado, and the Zirkles are in north central Colorado, we can see this fire right here called the Morgan Creek Fire. And that is the fire that is burning right towards our planned route in the Zirkel wilderness. And so this particular fire caused us to pivot again this summer. And this is why we are going to the Bighorns. So we have planned three detailed, complex, comprehensive nine day routes in both California and Colorado and are putting both of those trips on hold and instead going into the Wyoming Bighorns, which is a little bit of a wetter range in August. So hopefully it will be okay. Now, I've planned and replanned so many different trips this summer that I virtually memorized the methodical process that I use for planning complex routes. And I'll put a link to my trip planning online course in the show notes. And that kind of goes through the, the method that I use for trip planning. And I, I have gone through that process so many times in the past three years that um, I've almost memorized it, and um, I encourage, especially those of you who are unlimited members, you have access to that course for free. Take a look at it. It goes into quite a lot of detail regarding trip planning and map use and digital tools, and we talk about wildfire management in that course as well. I've stared at so many different topographic maps, aerial imagery, um, Gaia GPS, which is my mapping software that I like that I, I've almost become numb to the process. And part of me just wants to pack my pack, start driving until I find a smoke-free area, park the car, and just start walking somewhere, anywhere, just, long, just as long as it, it's smoke-free and I can just kind of be free. That's actually not really possible in, the, in most of the Mountain West. There are some... Um, havens of clean air in the inland area of Nevada and um, Utah. But for the most part, 
throughout the Rockies and throughout the Pacific Crest, it's pretty smoky this summer. One of the biggest things that's changed in my trip planning process is the extent to which I use historical fire maps, the extent to which I research trail maintenance projects in burned areas, and the extent to which I use aerial imagery to plan routes through areas that have previously been burned by wildfire. Large fire scars are so common now in the Mountain West that impacts to trails, off-trail travel, and access are really difficult to stay abreast of. I spend much more time on the phone now with uh, land management agencies and backcountry rangers collecting on the ground real-time information about conditions in burn areas than I ever have before. So again, let's walk through a few of the tools that I use. Uh, one, of the, one of the things I use, of course, is InsaWeb, which you see on the screen there. The other one I wanted to mention is the NOAA um, map, fire mapping system. And I use this primarily for smoke forecasting. So you can see on the screen there, the smoke plumes that are resulting from wildfires that are currently burning. And I find this valuable mainly for day-to-day -day living so that I can get a feel for where prevailing winds are blowing smoke um, in my, my area right now. Uh, but I also find it useful just to watch jet stream patterns and smoke patterns throughout the West because it's kind of fun to try to predict where the smoke is going to be the worst and based on where fires are burning and whatnot. And it is a predictable, forecastable thing, just, just like weather. So if big fires are burning throughout the West, I highly recommend this resource. I'll put it uh, a link to the show notes, a link in the show notes as well for this one. The other uh, tool that I use a lot, as I mentioned before, is Gaia GPS. The reason I like Gaia is... Um, it has integrated fire maps and very good quality satellite images. So here's a route that I had planned through the Zirkle Wilderness this summer. And if I bring up the satellite with labels layer, which is the layer that's provided by Mapbox and OpenStreetMap, this is the one that is a much higher uh, quality aerial imagery than the just plain satellite layer in Gaia. Then let's go ahead and look at one of our campsites here, which was in Wolverine Basin. And it's at this little lake here. And then I can zoom in. I was going to exit Wolverine Basin. But if I zoom in, I can see that this is a burn area. And you can clearly see this via satellite imagery. And Knowing that it's a recent burn area makes me shy away from wanting to do cross-country travel through it because it's going to have blowdowns and some tricky navigation, and it could be fairly slow. The other layer I really like in Gaia is to look at the current wildfires that are present, and this information comes directly from um, incident management systems that are managed by firefighters throughout the West. And if I zoom out of our route, we can see the Morgan Creek fire there. That's burning towards the West, towards our route. Now this has closed the entire Northern Zirkle Wilderness down or the, the central portion of the Zirkle Wilderness down. So we wouldn't be able to access our route anyways, even though the fire is not directly burning the route, but it is burning on both sides of the road that lead to the the trailhead that uh, we were proposing exiting. So again, I like to see this kind of stuff on the map I'm using to plan routes. So the second tool in the hiker's toolbox is the ability to find more remote areas. Now, big fires can result in the closure of vast swaths of wildlands for a year or more. Now, closure of new burn areas are essential to allow the environment to stabilize so as not to present a health and safety hazard to hikers and other recreational users. It takes time for the soils to restabilize. Uh, you'll know if you live in a wildfire prone area, 
flash floods and mudslides and debris slides are common in response to rain events. And so that is something to be aware of if you are hiking or traveling in or around areas that have had recent fire events. It takes time for streams to clear, burned trees to fall down, um, and trail, trailhead, and campsite maintenance projects to be completed. Now, these closures ultimately result in some increased pressure on the places that remain open. So if you combine this with all the pandemic fueled increases in outdoor participation, a growing population here out West and the <laughs> internet uh, facilitated publicity of both popular and lesser known hiking destinations. That means that the wilderness and wild places in general are becoming more crowded. There's less parking at trailheads and there's more competition for permits. And we have definitely seen an uptick in uh, permit competition, especially in places like the Sierra uh, in California and uh, major national parks out west like Rocky Mountain National Park, Yellowstone National Park, Glacier National Park, and the national parks in uh, the California Sierra, Sierra like Yosemite. So my response to this is not to play the competition game so much as it is to find more obscure places to hike that are further from population centers. This is one reason I like the Bighorns. It's fairly difficult range to get to. The closest major population center is Billings, Montana, but it's still a several hour drive from there. There's no direct flights to the Bighorns. Um, the airports that surround it are fairly small and it gets fairly light use away from the Cloud Peak area, which is, of course, a popular climbing desti destination. Now, my, res my response to this, as I said, is to find more obscure places, but I, I also, those are the kind of trips I like to do. I lean towards more physically challenging off-trail routes, and I within those mountain ranges that are less popular, I like to find the remotest spots in those ranges. And so if you, if you try to like get off the beaten path a little bit and not do what everyone else is doing now, I, I, don't get me wrong. The, the, the California Sierra around Mount Whitney or Bishop pass or up in Yosemite, these are world-class, beautiful, scenic hiking destinations. No argument from there, from me there, North Cascades, Mount Rainier area. Uh, the Colorado Rockies. I mean, these, these are these are destinations where people come from all over the world to experience. And, and there's no question that if you get a permit or can ever have the opportunity to hike in one of these scenic locations, do it. It's, it's a fantastic experience. But if you're looking to reduce the drama of your day-to-day -day bread and butter hiking and, and you're a regular visitor or you live out west, Search out some lesser known locations. Don't post them on social media and enjoy the enjoy and be content with the fact that you are exploring um, earth in all of its different variety. And I love places like that. I'm not as I grow older, I'm less and less of a mountain snob. Now I'm holding on to some of that because I still love the mountains, but I've come to appreciate the more subtle beauty that's found in uh, less dramatic environments. And I've really tried to focus on the experience and that has enriched instead of diluted my backpacking experience through the years. So I highly encourage uh, you explore off the beaten path a bit. Now, the third tool I want to talk about is decision-making in the presence of wildfire smoke. So wildfire smoke contains a toxic soup of particulate and gaseous compounds that can create both short and long-term health issues. Chronic and continuous exposure to fire smoke, especially during vigorous and sustained aerobic activity like multi-day backpacking is particularly problematic. And that's because it can create all sorts of respiratory distress in healthy people and outright dangerous health conditions in people who have pre-existing respiratory illnesses. And we're talking about things like 
asthma or CPOD, those with lung damage resulting from uh, years of smoking, lung cancer, COVID-19, cystic fibrosis, pneumonia, repeated bouts of pneumonia does lung damage to you. So all these things can um, really create uh, a predisposition to be incredibly sensitive to wildfire smoke. So let's talk a little bit about what what we're looking at in terms of what's in wildfire smoke. The composition of smoke depends on what's burning. So it's a little bit different if it's brush versus sagebrush or dry willows or, or pine trees or fir trees or homes, buildings, things like that. So it really depends on what the fire is burning and the composition is not easily predictable. I mean, wildfire smoke contains literally hundreds of different compounds and it's, it's complicated mix of, of things that's not easily predictable. But what we do know is um, the source of the fuel dictates what's in the smoke. The temperature of the fire, whether it's either smoldering or flaming, dictates what's in the smoke and the distance you are from the fire. So the farther away you are from the fire, if you if you're getting if I'm in Wyoming, and I'm getting smoke from California, okay, that's several hundred miles. In that several hundred mile journey, that smoke has had the chance to be exposed to sunlight and atmospheric chemicals. These two things can oxidize and transform the chemicals in wildfire wildfire smoke and actually make them more toxic. So if I'm getting a dose of smoke in Wyoming from a California fire, there's a good chance that it's more toxic than a similar dose of smoke near the source of that fire. So keep that in mind. The primary toxic chemicals we're looking at in fires include carbon monoxide, CO, volatile organic compounds. So these are uh, usually abbreviated as VOCs. So if you see the term VOCs in the literature, these are the uh, byproducts of burning um, organic fuels. Carbon dioxide. So you've certainly heard about the impact of carbon dioxide on climate change. So we see climate, ta climate change causing more wildfires, which are producing more CO2. So you can see the feedback loop there. Hydrocarbons, which are the generally toxic and often carcinogenic byproducts of burning organic fuels. So if you take a steak, put it on the barbecue, turn the flame up, you're going to blacken or char it. Those blackened portions, those are hydrocarbons. Okay. Nitrogen oxides, which are highly toxic. And then one toxic compound that you'll see as a component of wildfire smoke. It's a, it's a fraction that's measured in air quality index measurements, and that is particulates. And the, if you think of particulates, these are solid particles. The most visible is ash. So last year during the Mullen fire, we had ash falling in Laramie and I would go out every morning and see a layer of white ash on the hood of my pickup truck. Those are fairly large particles. They settle out close to the fire. And unless you're in an area where you're breathing in ash, they don't pose, ash does not pose a huge risk to uh, people who are far away from the fire. As you get farther away, smaller particles can stay in the air with the fire smoke. The one we're most concerned about is often denoted as PM2.5. PM These are particulate, this is particulate matter that is less than 2.5 microns in diameter. Why this cutoff is important is because particles of this size can embed into the lung tissues that promote oxygen transfer from the lungs into the bloodstream and they can inhibit blood oxygen concentration. So we're talking about deep lung tissue damage as a result of PM 2.5. Now your body responds to that by uh, producing 
an immune response to it. And I'm going to read an excerpt from um, a research article that I have. And it goes like this. The really small particles bypass these defenses. And by the defenses, I'm talking about the, the immune response and the filtration that exists naturally in your respiratory tract. So these small particles bypass these defenses and they disturb the air sacs where oxygen crosses over into the blood. We have an immune response to those particles and they're called macrophages. It's their job to seek out foreign material and remove or destroy that material. However, studies have shown that repeated exposure to elevated levels of wood smoke can suppress macrophages, leading to increases in lung inflammation. So we, we need to keep a very careful eye on PM2.5 as a component of wildfire smoke. Now, the, the index quantity that we monitor regularly is AQI. AQI is a composite measurement of five major categories of air pollutants that are regulated by the Clean Air Act. This includes ground level ozone, particle pollution, and when we measure AQI, we're looking at PM2.5 and PM10, uh, particles that are less than 10 microns in diameter, carbon monoxide, sulfur dioxide, and nitrogen dioxide. So the AQI scale goes from zero to 500, and generally zero to 50 is fine. That's air pollution at this level poses no risk to anybody, including those people who have sensitive respiratory diseases or conditions. Once you get in the area of 50 to 100, the air quality is okay. But for people who do have issues and are sensitive to air pollution, they may start to uh, elicit an immune response to the pollution. Once we get to 100, an AQI of 100, we're looking at air that is unhealthy for sensitive groups to breathe. Once we get to 150, we're looking at air pollution that is unhealthy for all members of the population. Once we get to 200, the risk of health effects is very unhealthy uh, for everybody. And at 300 or higher, it's full-on hazardous. And this is an emergency situation. This is the kind of scenario where everyone should avoid exposure to outdoor air, stay inside, shut your windows, uh, turn on your HEPA filters or whatever you have in your room to clean the air. As, as um, an estimate, let's look at the air quality in Estes Park, Colorado, last year in response to the East Troublesome Fire that burned uh, through Grand Lake in October of two, 2020 and caused massive amounts of smoke in Estes Park. The AQI in Estes was well over 200 throughout the duration of the uh, couple of weeks that the troublesome fire was at its peak. So the town of Estes eventually got evacuated because the fire jumped the Continental Divide and was burning towards the town. So this is the kind of scenario that can cause uh, AQI levels at that level. Now, as I said this morning in Laramie when I woke up, there was an AQI of 120, 130. It's been hovering around that most of the day today. And I can feel it. I got a sore throat. Um, I've had gunk in my throat, and that's from your immune body's immune response, attacking particles that are lodged in your trachea. And so, you know, you, you might be able to see my voice is actually a little bit raspy right now. So let's talk about how this impacts someone who's backpacking. The question I like to ask is at what level, there's two questions. The first one is at what levels of air pollution should I elect not to hike on a particular day during a backpacking trip? Okay. So we're on this multi-day backpacking trip. And the air quality is variable. So some days it might be good. Some days it might be bad. So this is resulting from a shift in prevailing winds, blowing smoke from a distant wildfire to your location. So my general rule of thumb, this is kind of what I go by. 
If the AQI is greater than 100, we limit the exercise if there are members of our group who are in a respiratory sensitive category. At AQIs of greater than 150, we all try to limit our exercise. That might be a rest day for us. It might be a day where we plan downhill travel only and not an extremely rigorous uh, mountain climb or, or hike um, that requires a lot of elevation gain and exertion. And at an AQI of greater than 200, this is generally unhealthy air for all persons regardless of uh, our exertion level. And at that point, we seriously got to consider exiting the trip and, and getting into clean air because that's not a, that's not an AQI level that you want to be exposed to for any length of time. The second question I like to ask is at what levels of air pollution should I cancel a backpacking trip? Now, if, if I know that I'm going to experience an AQI greater than 100 for the entirety of the trip, I may seriously consider canceling. Now I can do AQI of 100 to 150 here and there, but if this is going to be sustained 100, 150 uh, for any length of time, it might not be the best idea for me to spend two or three weeks in the wilderness because you never get a break from that and your body's immune response is just continuously attacking the particulate matter that is entering your body. At an AQI of greater than 150, if that is the if that is the permanent AQI that's going to be in your area of concern or area of travel, that is concerning to me because at that level, you you have unhealthy air, regardless of your exertion level, and you never get a break from it. And eventually your immune system response is going to be so strong that it's never going to get a break. And you're basically putting your body in a situation where you are slowly decaying day by day by day. So for long distance hikers, keep that in mind. If you're planning a long duration trip of two or three weeks in the wilderness, being exposed to an AQI of greater than 150 the entirety of that time may cause some lasting lung damage. Be careful. Okay, the final thing I want to talk about is wildfire escape contingencies. Now, the most frightening scenario for me, and Andrew touched on this in his interview with Jaden, is that it's the scenario where a wildfire starts nearby while I'm deep into the wilderness on a multi-day backpacking trip. Now, there have been a number of backcountry users who have been evacuated. Uh, the East Troublesome Fire last year hit during the peak of hunting season, and it was a dry fall, so there were a lot of hikers in the backcountry. And so there were people camping in the um, East Troublesome Creek area when that fire started last October that had to be evacuated with assistance from uh, fire crews and the Forest Service. So it's a, it's a serious issue. In the early 2000s, I was hiking in the Beartooth Mountain Range in Montana. A fire uh, was burning nearby when we started our trip, but it was quite small. And then an unforecasted storm event happened a few days later, created winds in the 50 to 60 mile per hour range and caused the fire to completely blow up it was immediately to our west. Uh, it was about 10 miles from where we were. By the time helicopters started flying over us as we were hiking, a person in the helicopter, this was a fire crew helicopter, dropped a PVC tu tube down to us. They saw us. Inside the tube was a note and a map. And the note said, get out now. You are in the line of a fire that's going to burn your direction. And here's the trailhead we want you to go to on the map. Now, the trailhead was, incidentally, the trailhead where I had left my car. It was, an, it was our exit trailhead. And so we made it out in a day and a half. It still took us a long time to get there because we were well off trail. But we made it back to the car. My car was the only car in the trailhead. 
and there was a gate across the road and my car was gated in to the trailhead. The trailhead had been closed so that no other people could enter in there. And we didn't really know what to do because we were gated into this remote trailhead and the smoke is thick and we can, we can smell the increasing intensity of the fire coming our way. And so we had a folding saw in my car and we ended up cutting um, a 10 foot uh, wide swath of trees that were, they were small, four to eight inches in diameter next to the trailhead gate so that we could drive my car around that gate and then exit. I learned as I was driving that I had left my camera on a stump, a, a sawed off stump at the trailhead. And I thought, oh man, I need to go back and get that. But I remember uh, getting out of the car and looking behind me and we could see this giant plume of smoke that was just getting thicker. And I knew there was no way I was going to go back and retrieve my, my camera. So we went home a couple weeks later, uh, rain and snow put the fire out. I came back to get my camera. Trailhead was open. I went to the stump. The stump was not burned, but the area around the trailhead had burned. The stump was in a little clearing actually, but my camera was a molten piece of plastic sitting on the stump. So again, nowhere near any flames, but the heat from the fire that swept through that trailhead area completely melted my camera into this mass of plastic and metal. So I, and incidentally, I never <laughs> recovered the pictures from that roll of film. This was back when I used uh, film instead of digital. So I was able to evacuate with assistance from uh, wildland firefighting crews who saw us visually and were, was able to communicate with us. That is not always a common scenario. So we have some tools available now that I didn't have back then that I feel are essential during wildfire season. So we've got some tools and I have some practices. The first one is that a satellite communications device of some type, whether it's a satellite phone or a messenger like the inReach, is critical for a couple reasons. One, I want to be able to retrieve real-time weather reports so I can understand what prevailing winds and weather forecasts are going to be into the next few days. So that if I observe a nearby wildfire, I know the general direction the winds are blowing and I can predict about where that fire's tailing edge is going to burn. And then I can know the direction I need to travel so I'm not going into that tailing edge of the wildfire and I can go away from it. The second thing I like a satellite messenger device for is that I can have someone I trust who's on the ground back home. I can communicate directly with them either via messaging, text messaging, or if I have a sat phone, I can call them on the sat phone and they can be monitoring wildfire incidents near me and give me some um, advice on uh, what's happening with a nearby fire that pops up in the middle of a trip. The other thing I do more now than I ever have in the past is ask the question, what do I do if a wildfire starts here? And I, I'll pick an arbitrary place on my trip based on where I might be along my route. And I will religiously study the terrain, the topography, and the aerial imagery. And I will always be studying and thinking about potential escape routes and potential problems or hazard areas if I do happen to get stuck in a situation where there's a wildfire nearby. The next thing I do is I, I look at as many contingencies as possible so that I know every possible route of escape and which of those routes are going to be the fastest in any given direction. I, I think you have to study the trail corridors and the topography of an area so that you know exactly, okay, this is my 
escape route option one to the south, and it's going to take me eight hours to get to the trailhead. Or I can take this one to the east, and it's going to take me 10 hours to get to the trailhead, but it's a little bit farther away from the fire. So though going through contingency scenarios like that, I find to be really valuable. The other tool I bring with me on summer trips during wildfire season is, as Jaden mentioned, an N95 mask. Jaden suggested as just a simple N95 mask. Um, I wholeheartedly agree that these are the lightest option. They're better than nothing. But I am, I'm a huge fan of the 3M 8210V N95 mask. And the reason I'm a fan of this mask is because it's actually the mask that's used by most wildland firefighters. It has the ability to filter out non-oil-based toxic pollutants, including PM2.5 and some of the gaseous organic compounds that are present in wildfire smoke. The thing I like about the V model is that it, there's an exit port on it, and it makes it much easier to breathe if you have to exert yourself in thick wildfire smoke. So you can uh, put on the mask, and then as you breathe out, there's a one-way exit port. So this is not the mask, obviously, recommended for infectious disease uh, management, but it's a great one for hiking in wildfire smoke. The other option that I see people wear quite a bit or, or pack quite a bit is the 3M8211. This is a, a paint painter's mask, so it can keep paint particles out and, and if you're sanding and doing construction and things like that. But it doesn't have the same ability to filter out toxic chemicals the way the 8210 does. So I recommend the 8210. Okay, that pretty much wraps up our segment on wildfires. Let's uh, transition into what's new at Backpacking Light. We had a member content contest, contest last month. And so what we did was um, we gave away an $800 Dydema Composite Fabrics tent to the member who posted the best trip report, blog post, and member gear review. And we had uh, several dozen submissions, and we awarded a winner to BPL member Manfred, who wrote a fantastic blog post, a terrific trip report, and a very high-quality gear review. We'll link to all those in the show notes. Congratulations, Manfred. I was particularly drawn in by his trip report about um, a trip in the Grand Canyon that he took. He included uh, several pictures that were just gorgeous, and it's, it's so inspiring to see and read about people's experiences in places as majestic as the canyon, and, and uh, I was really excited to see that trip report. So again, congratulations, Manfred. I hope you will get good use out of that DCF tent. You can see uh, new member content um, on if you sign up for our email newsletter, if you go to backpackinglight.com slash newsletter, we feature member content, not every week, but most weeks we'll feature a blog post and or a trip report and or a member gear review. And uh, just, to, just to get that member content out there. It's really cool. It's one of the features of the new site we have. And what we're seeing is that getting some of the, the first posts of these kinds of things out of the forums and in an in their own article format has really ramped up the traffic that is visiting those posts because it's it's featured to a wider audience than just those folks who participate in the forums. Now, forums are still attached to member blog posts and member trip reports, and so there's always some great discussion at the ends of those as well. Now, you can also see member content at backpackandlight.com by exploring the list that appears underneath our community menu. Or become a member at backpackinglight.com slash membership. And you can submit your own trip reports, blog posts, or member gear reviews. We'd love to have you share with our community. I want to feature a forum thread and talk about a topic that has received a lot of in, uh, engagement uh, this week. And that's, that's a forum thread titled Shelter Entry and Exit Contortions. We'll put a link to it in the show notes. Here's the issue. 
The issue is that you have to contort yourself to get in and out of some small ultralight shelters, especially when those shelters have inner tents made uh, with zippered doors and you have zippered vestibules and things like that. So this can be problematic, especially if you have a full bladder and really need to go to the bathroom and have a difficult time fiddling with some of these things and trying to contort yourself out of your sleeping bag or quilt and exit the tent. Um, older folks with aging and achy backs, that includes me. Uh, sometimes we wake up pretty stiff in the middle of the night or in the morning. And so getting in and out of the tent is not as easy as it used to be. And then nighttime calls to nature. Uh, it's hard to see. You may have misplaced your headlamp and now you got to fiddle around with a couple of zippers to get out of your tent. So some of the solutions that I use and some of the solutions that were brought up in the forum thread, which I thought this is a, a great resource for a skill that's not often addressed as a core backpacking skill. Selection of your tent. So I, I like tents that have large side entry doors rather than small end, end entry doors. Uh, one of my favorites that has a giant door is the Tarp Tent Eon Lithium. Um, big tent, uh, big door, big vestibule, big side entry. Um, great option. You don't have to contort yourself too badly to get in and out of that one. You could add long, reflective, or glow-in-the-dark pieces of cordage to your zippers so they're easy to see at night and they're easy to find if you have a flashlight. Always keep your headlight in the exact same spot every single night you spend in the backcountry. That way you always know where to get it, even if it's pitch dark, your eyes are blurry, and you just you just know where to put your hand and know where to grab that headlamp. I have also made the habit of wearing a small keychain light, a photon light, around a very thin lanyard around my neck. It stays around my neck 24-7, so I always have access to that. If I absolutely need it and I can't find my headlamp. On fair weather nights, you can sleep with the vestibule and or tent doors open. I do this very often, especially as mosquito season goes away and it provides additional airflow, additional breeze, more comfort, as long as it's not too cold out. And then I don't have to deal with uh, zipping, uh, unzipping two doors to get out of my tent every night. You could position the zipper pull pulls on your vestibule and tent doors in an optimum location so that you can grab them and reach them easily from your sleeping bag. Um, and if you put them in the same location every time, then you, then you know, they're there. The, the common scenario is these, especially these zippers that have the J shape, the doors that have the J shaped zippers where the zippers can be zipped way over into a remote corner of your tent. Those can be hard to reach, hard to find, and might require you to contort yourself to get up into that corner. So doors that have double zippers, you might slide both sliders up to the middle of the door somewhere in a location that's more convenient for you to reach them. Finally, someone brought up that if you have room to squat or stand or kneel in your tent, you can avoid getting out of it all together and take a pee bottle with you to bed. I don't do this in the summer, but I do in the winter. And my favorite pee bottle is the Nalgene wide mouth canteen, which is a soft sided wide mouth water bottle. Just make sure to clearly mark it. So you do not confuse it as a water bottle. I put a big school and crossbones on mine with a Sharpie pen and write urine only. That way there's just, there's no question. You can, you can put your own art on yours as appropriate. Okay, that is going to do it for this episode of the Backpacking Light Podcast. This podcast is advertising free, which is made possible through the membership fees paid by Backpacking Light members. A backpackinglight.com membership gives you access to more than 20 years of archives, forums, and online courses. So please consider supporting this podcast and become a member right now at backpackinglight.com slash membership. You can download the show notes for this podcast episode at backpackandlight.com slash podcast. We made a number of references in this episode. There's going to be a ton of links for you to um, explore. I've been experimenting lately with putting 
some automatically generated transcripts of each podcast episode. I'll probably do that for this one as well. Please email us at podcast at backpackandlight.com and let us know what you think. I know they're not 100% accurate because they are automatically generated. It costs quite a bit more to have a human go in and edit those, but we're considering that. But I'd like you to go in, take a look at the automatically generated transcripts. Let us know what you think. They're searchable and you can click on any word in the transcript and immediately go to that part of the audio recording of the podcast. So there's some really cool features there. We're exploring it. We know they're, they can be buggy, but check them out. Let us know what you think. And if, if there's a compelling reason for us to do so and, and enough people are getting value out of these transcripts, then we may upgrade to the next level of transcript and have a human go in and edit them so they're more accurate. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a review. It helps other people find the show. Now, I would like you to leave an honest review. I read all of the podcast reviews. I'm not going to bribe you to write a five-star review. I want to know your honest opinion about what you think of the podcast. Now, that said, if you are getting value from this podcast and it's worth five stars, go and leave us a five-star review because we would <laughs> love to have it. Um, reviews game the algorithm, especially in iTunes. And so the more reviews we have, the more likely it is someone will find the Backpack and Light podcast when they are searching for podcasts about outdoor and hiking and camping and backpacking skills. All right, everybody, thank you for listening to the Backpack and Light podcast. I'm Ryan Jordan, and if I can leave you with one party message today, it's this. Pack less, be more, because lighter is better. Happy trails. So I shouldered my backpack, walk away from the car.